so let's check in with Alvin on this topic. He's our friend, he's an atheist, and he tells Carol, his friend, uh, look, I've been told that Jesus died for my sins to save me, but I, I don't really get it. Jesus died, so what? And Carol is not sure what to say, but she knows a Bible verse, and she says, well, Romans 5, 8 says God demonstrates his own love to, for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So is this really helpful to Alvin at this point? It's not really, right? He's just stating the facts of the atonement. But actually what Alvin is asking more about, what's the meaning of it? What does it mean? And so I would say this is a, this is a thumbs down. And so with keep, keeping that in mind, we're going to, our aim is to answer two questions that, that are going to um, be helpful in our conversations with people like Alvin. How exactly does Christ's life and death solve our sin problem and reconcile us to God? How does it work? And then secondly, how can we respond to some main primary objections to the atonement? Okay? In Mere Christianity, um, C.S. Lewis explains that there's a really strong connection between meaning and truth, right? He said uh, that he argued that grasping the meaning of something, a concept, is, a pre is the preliminary condition of judging its truth or falsity. So he said, for me, reason is the natural organ of truth, but imagination is the organ of meaning. So what does he mean by that? It's with our imagination we grasp concepts and we, we sometimes use metaphors, analogies, images, and story to help us understand the meaning of things. So with this in mind, with that kind of understanding that we've got to get at the meaning of something before someone uh, judges the truth of something, um, that's going to be our goal tonight. So. Uh, one thing preliminary that, especially if you are a Christian, which many of you are, um, we need to kind of get back to um, the perspective that the, the incarnate Christ, the God-man dying on the cross, is, scan is a scandal, right? It's radical. We, we don't think of it that way, but it is. And... Um, so when talking to our friends like Alvin, we need to regain that perspective from his point of view that it's kind of scandalous what we're, what we're offering in the gospel. Um, in Paul's day, he encountered mis misunderstandings. Um, he told the Corinthians, we preach Christ crucified, preaching which to the Jews is a scandal and an offensive stumbling block, and to the Gentiles it's absurd and utterly unphilosophical nonsense. Right? So he ran into that. And uh, it's con it really continues because if you are like a Jew or you're a, like not familiar with Christian ideas or concepts as a, as a Gentile in his day, it can be utter nonsense to talk about this. So uh, in 1600s, let's see, Faustus in 1600s felt this way, and guess what? He was a Unitarian theologian. So what does that mean he believed about Christ? He didn't believe Christ was God. Christ was just a human. So he had a lot of problems with the atonement, and he critiqued it a lot. And Turretin, who was in his day uh, a little bit later, uh, responded to him. So it's not, a new, it's not a new thing for people to question and try to understand the atonement. Um, one thing about just the doctrine of atonement in general, we think of it, what, with relation to the cross, right? Generally, you think of the atonement, you think of Christ dying on the cross. But actually, it encompasses the whole work of Christ, his incarnation, his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. So one other thing about the atonement that you should know is that it is central to Christianity and to our salvation. But unlike the Trinity or the Incarnation where we have a creedal statement from an ecumenical council, there's nothing like that for the atonement. There's no official 
you know, creed that we can turn to, that everybody worked that out at one time. <clears throat> so instead, what we have are some, are, we have theories from the early church fathers and onward, and that's what we're, we are going to get to that. But w- what I want to do is to define it briefly. Um, the Hebrew, atonement's an English word, and it means to reconcile, or it's reconciling God and man. But the Hebrew word is kafar, and it means to cover or cancel sin. And Hebrew kippur, kippur means to purify or cleanse. And the Greek word is katalaj, which means to reconcile. And of course, in 1 Corinthians um, 15.3, we just have the bare facts given to us by Paul. He says, I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That's just the facts of the atonement, right? So what we can say is that salvation is the result of Christ's work. You know, it's the result of Christ's work. But... What's happening in the black box, right? What's happening in there? We have the work of Christ. We have our human condition before salvation. But now then we're reconciled after the atonement. We're reconciled to God. So the theories of atonement that we're going to go over, they, they try to say what's here, what's in the black box, right? They're not gonna, they, they want to get the facts out and tell you what, how is this work? Um, so what's in the black box? How does Jesus' life, death, and resurrection deal with our sin and our estrangement from God? So if we're going to evaluate or consider theories of atonement, one thing that they need to do is account for all the biblical data because there's a lot of biblical data about the, the atonement. So we're, that's what we're going to do first is say, what, do, what needs explaining? What concepts are surrounding the atonement that we need to understand and grasp? Um, the first one is sacrifice. So the predominant motif of the atonement in the New Testament characterizes Christ's death as a sacrificial offering to God on our behalf. So even Jesus saw his death as a sacrifice, like the Passover sacrifice. In, you know, in, in the Last Supper in the upper room, he says, uh, take it, this is my body given for you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Um, and in Paul says to the Ephesians, Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Again, sacrifice motif. And... Um, in Leviticus 17.11, God says when he is laying out his uh, way that, that, that uh, the way that Israelites can, can come into his presence or have him dwell in their presence is through um, the sacrificial law that he gave. And he says, for the, this is in Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Okay, so that's God telling us. The next, is everybody good with sacrifice? That's the predominant motif. The next one is expiation. And expiation just means to remove or cancel or or wipe away. And that's concerning our sin, right? So um, did y'all know tomorrow is um, the Day of Atonement? Yom Kippur, which is very interesting. I I just found that. I just found that out. So this is very fitting that we're talking about this. So in Leviticus 16 and 17, um, the Day of Atonement, was instituted by God as an annual sacrifice on behalf of the whole nation of Israel. And it was to cover all their sins, all kinds of sins, moral sins, transgressions, um, iniquities. And if you remember, one, they, they had two goats. One goat 
was sacrificed and the other was released into the desert. The scapegoat, the one released into the desert, symbolically bore the nation's sins and was driven out. So the, that's the expiation. It's going away from the camp, right? The other, the blood of the sacrificial goat, was offered in the Holy of Holies to atone for the sins of the people. So one thing we have to remember is um, God instituted the sacrificial system, and it was provisional. It was almost a precursor or a shadow or a type of what was to come to be permanent. So it was a provisional way that God handled being able to have a relationship with Israel and him dwell in, in their presence in the Holy of Holies, right? Um, and we know that New Testament authors, uh, especially in Hebrews, who we don't know the author of Hebrews, remember from last week, says ten, in Hebrews 10.4, it is impossible. So they knew, they knew that, that the sacrificial system was provisional because uh, he says, this author says, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins, right? But in Hebrews 9.26, he says, Christ removed sin by the sacrifice of himself. So um, we're looking at a, a very detailed sacrificial system that was put in place by God as, as a provision for Israel and also a precursor to what Christ was going to do. Okay, is that good expiation? Let's do propitiation. So propitiation means to appease or satisfy. So again, um, in order for God to dwell in the tabernacle or the temple and later in the temple amidst his sinful people, he required purification sacrifices and this required blood from the sacrifices to be applied to the mercy seat uh, on the, of the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies, right? And you might, do you recall what happened to Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, what they did, how serious it was? <laughs> yeah, what, and what happened to them? Okay, so they were, you know, they were uh, struck down. They came near to God's presence, right, in an unauthorized way, and God struck them dead. So God had very strict laws about coming into his presence. This was a real, you know, there were real consequences, in other words. Um, in Hebrews 9.22, the author says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And in Romans 5.9, um, Paul says, since therefore we are now justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? So this idea of that we need to satisfy uh, God's justice or his anger at sin um, by the shedding of blood. However, um, we're going to have more to say about this because this was one way that God forgave sins, but we're going to find out that there's other ways too. But the primary way for him to dwell in the Holy of Holies had to do with the blood offered on, on the uh, mercy seat. Um, is that good? We're going to talk, we're going to talk more about God uh, turning his anger away in just a minute. So say, uh, the, the reason I have Satan uh, in here is because sometimes we think, well, Jesus just came to save me or save sinners. That's the only reason why he died on the cross. But uh, it's actually bigger than that because Jesus had to also deal with Satan because Satan has been our accuser and he's called our accuser and the ruler of the world with his demons. So Jesus also had to deal with Satan. So that should be a, some biblical data that shows up in uh, the theory. Um, 1 John 3, 8 says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And John 5, 19, if you, if you wonder whether Satan really had any control, has any control, uh, says the whole world is under the control of the evil one. 
And as far as being an accuser, there's lots of places where uh, we see Satan being accuser. Zechariah 3.1 says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And in Revelation 12.10, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and power of the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And we get a taste of that in Job 1. Um, Job 1, 6 says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came, came among them. And remember, what was, what was, Job, what was uh, Satan accusing? Who was Satan accusing? Job, right? Saying, oh, this guy, he only, he's only faithful because you, you bless him with lots of good stuff. He'll turn from you if you don't bless him, right? So he's also accusing God. And uh, in Job 1.12, it's interesting because uh, God gives him some power. He says, then the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power, meaning Job. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So he's still under God's authority, but God wants him to um, test Job and see if, if Satan's right. In other words, give me the evidence. Go ahead and do it, and let's see if you're right. So this is a, a picture of like a divine council, or you could say a heavenly courtroom, where Satan's come to accuse, and God has to deal with his accusations. So who else? This idea of I'm uh, letting Satan come and uh, uh, tempt you or sift you also shows up in the New Testament because Jesus tells Peter, Satan has asked and de or demanded permission to sift you like wheat. Do you remember that? That's right before he, um, you know, his three denials. But Jesus is warning Peter that Satan has asked me, demanded permission to, to sift you. So Satan is really is, uh, all this time has been our accuser against God. Okay, right? Y'all, is that good? So, oh, so Isaiah 53 is a very important um, chapter with regard to the atonement. Um, it it gives us a, a servant who suffers vicariously for the sins of others, bearing the punishment they deserved, that they might be reconciled to God. And New Testament authors saw Jesus as the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. Do you all remember the story of Philip, who the Holy Spirit sent on the road because the Ethiopian eunuch was reading the Bible and didn't understand what he was reading. And Philip had, uh, the Holy Spirit said, you need to go uh, witness to this guy. And what was he reading? He was reading Isaiah 53. And he says, who, is, who are they talking, who's talking here, the, the prophet or someone else? And Philip says, it's Jesus. So he shared uh, Jesus and the gospel, and the guy was baptized. So New Testament apostles tied Isaiah 53 to Jesus. Um, there's five traits in that chapter that uh, line up that we need to uh, notice. Um, one is the, the suffering servant suffers for the sins of others, not himself, and he, he's sinless. He's personally sinless and righteous, and it's an act that's a once for all, not repeated, not repeated like the sacrifices. And God intentionally brings about the vicarious suffering of the one. And what, what it meaning that God's providence is involved in the suffering of the servant and also the voluntary will between the Lord and this servant. So they're in unity with what, what's happening. Okay? Okay. So the other, other concept is the concept of, of having a representative substitute. So in 2 Corinthians 5.14, Paul says, We are convinced that one has died for all, 
Therefore, all have died. So Christ, God didn't just uh, you know, pick Jacob up out of a random dude to die on the cross um, to be a whipping boy for us. In, in other words, um, we have a, a representative Jesus who uh, took on our human nature and is our representative. So Christ didn't simply die in my place. He's my representative, which means whatever he did, I did. That's how close the union is. Christ died, I died. Christ rose, I'm going to rise. So we come to identify with Jesus, death and resurrection. Um, The way we appropriate the benefits of Christ's atoning death is in our response of faith and culminating in our baptism as a a public uh, pronouncement. Okay. The next concept is redemption. So redemption, you think of like buying back something, paying for buying back, redeeming something. So Christ's death is seen as the ransom paid to God for our forgiveness and cleansing. Mark 10, 45 says, I gave my life as a ransom for many. That's Jesus talking. And God's plan was to actually supply and receive the ransom that redeems us. Uh, In 1 Corinthians 6.20 and 7.23, Paul says, you were bought with a price. So that's this idea of redemption or buying back. And lastly, we have divine justice. So this is rooted in, in legal terminology. We're talking about courtroom type of concept, if, if you will. Um, Genesis 18.25 says, God is the judge of all the earth. He's not, he, he's not just a private offended party, you know, that can just forgive someone privately for some. He's the judge of all the earth um, and the lawgiver. Romans 1.18 says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and righteousness. Um, Romans 3.19, Paul says, All the world has become accountable to God. So then, um, so I, I, ha- I have a little wrench to put in this, though. Um, in Romans 3.21 through 26, Paul says this, so hang with me. Christ's death demonstrated God's righteousness because in the forbearance in, in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Have you ever wondered what, what that is that him he's passing over? Like, you go, wait a minute. God's God's justice, you know, why, why, how is he passing over, hand waving away or passing over sins? Um, and this is not the only place that, that uh, says this. Um, we know that the sacrificial system didn't actually, in reality, deal with sin or wipe it away or cleanse the conscience, right? So it wasn't actually doing what Christ did. It was provisional. It was there as a temporary thing that God used. But so how else? So that's, that is true. The sacrificial system was in place. But how else did God turn away from wrath in the Old Testament? Well, it turns out there, there's lots of examples of him just responding to repentance and forgiving, right? So in Numbers 11, Uh, or Exodus 32, when God's anger burned against the Israelites, Moses interceded for them, and so the Lord turned away from his wrath. Okay? That's good. But that didn't require, there was no, there's no blood on um, on the mercy seat here. Also in Jonah 3, 10, remember Nineveh? So 
the Ninevites were going to get destroyed, and Jonah, was gonna, Jonah went to tell them about it. But what happened? They repented, right? So they repented at, at Jonah's preaching, and God relented, it and he didn't destroy them. So his wrath was turned away at that, at that time. And Paul mentions this again. He says, look, God, having overlooked the times of ignorance, passing over sin, he is now declaring to men that all everywhere should repent because he's fixed a day in, in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom, whom he has appointed, Jesus, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Okay? So it's true the sacrificial system was in place, and God definitely used that when he was present with the um, Israelites. But he had other ways of, of turning away his wrath in the past, but not anymore. Since, since he sent Jesus, the way to forgiveness is going to be from the atonement, the permanent atonement of Jesus. Is that, is that, cl- is that good? Do you all have questions or comments? Oh, good. Okay. So now we have the data that needs to be explained. So when we're going through these theories, there's seven theories. But you need to think in your mind, well, is it explaining all the data? Or which data are they concentrating on? And what, what data is being explained? So these are the seven. There's one, two, three, four, five. There's seven that we're going to go through. OK? The first one I like, and I call it, it's not, call, it's not really called the integrated theory. But it's Eusebius, and I like him because he kind of tries to put it all together instead of just being very narrow about one part of the biblical data. So um, this is what he says. He says, and I've underlined the places where he's, he's bringing in the data. The Lamb of God was chastised on our behalf and suffered a penalty he did not owe. So he's sinless, he's substitute, he's like the Passover lamb, he's sacrifice, but which we owed because of the multitude of our sins. And so he became the cause of the forgiveness of our sins because he received death for us and transferred to himself the scourging, the insults, and the dishonor which were due to us and drew down on himself the apportioned curse being made a curse for us. And what is that but the price of our souls? So you see how many things he's including in here? I just like this one. It's almost this, is it one sentence? Almost, right? Almost. Um, That he tries to pack a lot of it in. Um, He's known for other things, but I like that he included it all. The next one is origin. And this is the ransom theory, which, which in early church fathers, very popular and they had a lot of discussion about the ransom theory. So Jesus died as a ransom sacrifice paid to, Origen says, to Satan, who held us captive to satisfy the debt sinners owe. Do, does anyone think that's a problem? Because there's a lot of debate in the early church. You say, no? OK, me, I, I used to think that, too. I'm like, I'm going to try to persuade you otherwise. Uh, so somebody said, no, that can't be right. It's got to be that, uh, that Jesus offers sacrifice paid to God, right? So, but he, he stands on, on this, on paying it to Satan, and he says, Captive, we're captors, captives conquered by sin as if by war. So it's sort of a battle-type uh, um, metaphor. Uh, we're being held fast then by the, enemies of the hum- by the enemies of the human race. The Son of God gave himself as the redemption price, so that's the ransom. That is to say he handed himself over to the enemies, over to Satan, and what is more, poured out his own blood to those thirsting for it. Okay, let's see what we can say about, about origin. So he thinks that Jesus took our place not so that God could punish and torture Jesus, but to allow Satan to kill him. 
So Jesus offered himself to Satan to be killed. And Irenaeus, he got this a little bit from Irenaeus, which who was before him, thought that Satan had a certain legal rights over man in virtue of our sinning that God had to respect, that we were kind of, we sold ourselves out to Satan by, by rebelling against God in our unbelief. Uh, Eusebius thinks that, the, that that's wrong, and he was a little bit later. He says that Jesus' substitutionary sacrifice is a ransom paid to God, which you can also understand, right? Because aren't our, we, when we sin, we sin against God. That's, where, that's who we're sinning against. So really, it could be that, the, that Christ was offering himself as a sacrifice to God because that's who we have offended or that's who our sin is against. Can you see both explanations, though? No. No? What? Like, wouldn't it be more appropriate to call it a debt payment to, to God? Forgive us our debt to God. Yeah, yeah. Versus to ransom. To ransom is more like, yeah. But they didn't take it that way. They, the, some people said it was a ransom payment to God, yeah. Okay. Yes, and I was, let, let me get to that, but wait just a second. And that's, that's interesting, too. Um, 1 John 5, 19 says, We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. That's just talking about that Satan, Satan has some, deli, you know, authority or, or it's probably usurped authority, doesn't have a, a legitimate right to us, but he is, has power over sinners who are, who have rebelled against God. Um, so I think we could say fallen human beings prior to coming to Christ, we're within Satan's power. Um, C.S. Lewis uses this ransom theory in, uh, do any of you know The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Are you familiar with it? So what does the white witch say to Aslan when she's got Edmund? She says, I'm demanding Edmund's death, his blood. He demands, she, she demands it. And a Aslan exchanges himself for Edmund. But we can talk about it afterward because we're not going to have time. Uh, we're not going to have time to get into it. Ask me afterwards whether I think uh, this is a total ransom theory that, that he's proposing. I, I, have a, I have a view of it. Um, the next one is also origin, and this is very much tied to the ransom theory. It's Christus Victor. It wasn't called Christus Victor all these all the years. In 1931, uh, Gustav Al Allen coined that term, but it's basically this model that early church fathers had for a long time and still. I mean, still do, is that Christ achieved victory over sin, death, and Satan through his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. And um, so this is what Origen says. He blotted out the written bond that was against us by his own blood and took it out of the way, see the expiation, so that not even a trace, not even our blotted out sins might still be found and nailed it to the cross. Um, who having put off from himself the principalities and powers, Satan, made a show of them openly triumphing over them by the cross. Okay? Um, this Christus Victor is very popular from early church fathers all the way to Anselm, and then it's still popular today. Um, Augustine even says in, in his, uh, on the Trinity, he says, he affirms that Christ conquered Satan when he rose from the dead. So that was his, he says, it has not been difficult to see that the devil was conquered when he, was, he who was slain by him rose again. Um, one thing to note is that you might go, well, is Satan really, is he really, uh, you know, is he really done with? And I think what we like to say is that Satan's power is broken, especially if you're a Christian and have the Holy Spirit, Satan's power is broken over you. He cannot accuse you anymore. Um, 
in his fate is sealed, but he's not powerless yet until his ultimate destruction at the end of the age. So you just have to keep that in mind. Okay, the next one is satisfaction theory. This is Anselm in the 1100s, and he did something a little different. Um, it's kind of a judicial or commercial metaphor or image. He says, um, Jesus voluntarily died to satisfy the justice of God through compensation, was his term. Not that Jesus was punished, but Jesus voluntarily gave his life, paid our debt because all men were due to die. So Christ, on his view, Christ isn't being punished for, for our sins. So what, what is he trying to get away from? We want to not say that Jesus was sinful. Jesus, uh, it's, a, it's, it's not right to say that Jesus is, is now on the cross and be, has become sinful. So this, this, he doesn't have to say that. Um, Christ didn't pay the penalty for sins. Rather, he offers a compensation to God on our behalf. And God rewards Jesus, and Jesus gives the reward to us, which is our salvation. That's how it works for him. Um, so Colossians 2.14, Paul says, Christ canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us and which was hostile to us, and he is taking it out of the way. That's an expiation. So God's justice wasn't satisfied by the elaborate. Remember, uh, the New Testament apostles and the authors knew that the sacrificial system didn't satisfy God's justice, his wrath. Um, so, but Jesus does in his death. And so no further satisfaction is needed. And there are no longer past sins that are overlooked or, or unpunished. Um, I don't have time to, sorry, Michael, I don't have time to, to bring in Irenaeus. But here, oh, let's, this is what he says. So, um, So that only God can provide the satisfaction that God needs for uh, payment for our sins, okay? So the moral influence theory was another um, medieval scholastic, and he said Jesus' life, death, and resurrection are our example. So he's, he's, he's coming from our point of view, not God's point of view. So he says... As we contemplate Christ's voluntary sacrifice, we're moved to repentance and love for God. And um, our hearts need to be changed so that our hostility to God evaporates and we embrace his love. So Christ's sacrificial love is meant to awaken us for moral change as sinners. Um, I think this, this, uh, this doesn't cover a lot of the biblical data, but it covers something that no one else is saying, which is what our response is to the cross, right? So I think it's needed. It's just not comprehensive very much. And then now we come to penal substitution. I, I, these are the reformers that came up with this. And so I put Martin Luther and John Calvin both that Jesus' death satisfies God's wrath against human sin. And Jesus endured the punishment in the sinner's place. So see, uh, not like Anselm saying it was not punishment, the, the reformers are saying, yes, it is punishment. Our sins and guilt are imputed to Christ and are expiated, removed by Christ's representative substitutionary death. And Christ's righteousness is then imputed to us. Um, So it's very similar to Anselm, except for its punishment. And they added the, the idea of imputation. Um, imputation just means um, to hold him who has not done a thing as if he had done it. So that's what it means to say our sin was imputed to Christ. 
it doesn't mean he became sinful or he, uh, that he became sinful. It means that it's more of a legal term. He's legally guilty by, in, by in, we're imputing our sin to him or he voluntarily imputes our sin to him, uh, to himself. Um, Kind of the same way you think about Christ's righteousness imputed to you. It's a legal thing. It doesn't mean that you don't need to be sanctified throughout your whole entire life. It's more of a point in time legal. And that's what it means for us to impute our sin, him to impute our sins to himself. Um, like Augustine, Augustine affirms penal substitution, but he didn't like imputation. He just wanted to steer clear of, of Jesus being sinful at all. So he says there's no imputation, but there's penal substitution. But the imputation, I think, is nece necessary, and we can talk about it, um, to say, uh, because uh, otherwise, what it, what it, what's, being, what's being punished, right? If, there's not, uh, if Christ didn't bear our sin or have our sins imputed to him. Um, okay, is that, was that clear? You got that? That's the one you probably mostly hear in evangelical churches, right? Is that the one you grew up with that your pastor mostly um, gives? Um, so Calvin says, we're estranged from God, heirs of wrath, exposed to the curse of eternal death, excluded from all hope of salvation, a complete alien from the blessing of God, the slave of Satan, captive under the yoke of sin, and uh, took the punishment upon himself and bore what by the just judgment of God was impending over sinners. Expiating sins, right? And satisf satisfied and duly propitiated God the Father. He's, he, he's hitting a lot of the biblical data. Do you see that? And by his intercession, appeased his anger on the basis benevolent, on this basis, benevolence toward them. Um, there's, a, there's a new, this, is, this guy's not a, a reformer. He's a modern scholar, and his name is James Agnew. And he's, his, his theory, he calls the divine counsel theory, that in the heavenly courts, Satan accuses sinful humanity and condemns us to death, just like we talked about in the data, in the biblical data. Satan incited the authorities to kill Jesus, which he did not have a legal right to do because Jesus was sinless. He was removed from the court, that's Satan, because he had no legal right to kill Jesus. And as our high priest, Jesus entered the heavenly places as our high priest, oh, I said that twice, with his blood and presented himself sinless as our representative sacrifice. So it's kind of, it's a courtroom scene. Satan's accusing and Satan has killed Jesus, only he shouldn't have because Jesus didn't, didn't deserve death. He was sinless. And uh, Jesus comes in and says, nope, you're wrong, after he is risen from the dead and he, and he takes his blood to present the, him as a sacri himself as a sacrifice in the court and to kick Satan out of the heavenly court. Um, I think in Acts 2, 22 through 24, we can agree with uh, James Agnew about... Uh, Satan inciting the authorities to kill Jesus. He's, he's, he's a, a behind it all. Remember, he entered Judas to betray uh, Jesus. And, um, and Acts 2.22 says he, that Jesus was delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You nailed to a cross by hands of godless men and put him to death. Um, so Christ has put away sin by the sacrifice of himself and we're no longer under Satan's condemnation. Remember in Romans, Paul says, you are therefore now, not, there's no condemnation because Satan is, is, can't accuse you anymore. 
So when we accept Christ as our representative Savior, his blood, his life covers us and we're forgiven and restored to our relationship with God. And we can enter, Christ, enter God's presence. So let's see. Yeah, so that, that's just Revelation 12.10 about Satan being the accuser. Um, so there's, there's evidence that the church fathers, the medieval scholastics, the reformers, and even modern scholars understand the doctrine of atonement as multifaceted. And so it's like a gem, right? Like a multifaceted gem. And even though the theories are diverse, kind of focusing on maybe specific biblical data, they... Uh, when taken together, the theories account can account for all of the bi biblical data that we discussed on the atonement. So I don't think there, maybe a, there's a few points of mutual exclusiveness, but I think they, when taken together, they, they complement each other, and there's no need to pit theories against them, you know, pit them against each other. Um, like, I want, I want to give you homework. Like, the next time you hear a hymn or song in church, try to figure out, and if it's about the atonement, what, what theories or what biblical data is it? Uh, like, I, I went through In Christ Alone, and this was just kind of what I came up with. Do y'all sing that? You know that hymn? Um, so it's almost all of them are end up being talked about in, in this hymn. So that, you know, so when you're in church, you're singing, don't just let your mind wander. You can um, say, oh, that's that data that, you know, that's that theory that, that is being highlighted. Okay, so let's talk, let's, we need to answer some objections that come up. Um, the first one I have that Alvin might have, is why couldn't God just forgive sinners without the cross? We saw that God turned away his wrath sometimes in the Old Testament just with repentance. So what is the deal? And there's been different responses in church history. You might be surprised to know that Augustine and Aquinas both thought that the incarnation and death of Christ weren't absolutely necessary for salvation. What they did say was that God freely chose this way, the cross and atonement, as the most appropriate way of achieving our salvation. They agree with that. So we're, they're, not, they're not disagreeing. They're just saying it wasn't ne they didn't think it was necessary. And then we have a lot more, Origen, Anselm, Luther, Calvin, that they believe that Christ's incarnation and atoning death were indeed necessary for our salvation and that divine justice is an essential part of God's nature. So, you, you know, if you, if you were talking to Alvin, you could bring out the fact that God did turn away his wrath in different ways in the, in the Old Testament, but not now because Paul says now everyone needs to come to uh, him through Christ's atonement. So it's no longer this passing over of, of forbearance of sins in the past. So the next objection is penal substitution is unjust because God is punishing an innocent person, right? Jesus is sinless, and he's being punished. So first of all, we can say, well, wait a minute. Some, some substitution theorists and penal substitution theorists don't affirm that Christ was punished. They would ra they rather say Christ voluntarily en endured the suffering that would have been ours, our punishment, had it been on us. So he's enduring the suffering that would have been our punishment. That's how they would say it if they, if, if they didn't believe in um, that Christ was actually punished. But, uh, in, in like in Anselm's satisfaction theory, Christ, is satisfied, Christ satisfies God's justice by compensation, paying our debt, not by enduring punishment. That's not, what he, that's not what he was about. 
But remember, the reformers had an answer for this. And it's not, it, it's not that it made Christ sinful, remember, but our sin was imputed to Christ, so he's legally blameworthy before God, and he can take our, our punishment in that regard, okay? So does that make sense? So the imputation is important. And also in our own courts, vicarious liability exists in human legal systems where, um, okay, you lawyers, Audrey, you know, an employer can be liable for employees' wrongdoing, right, in, under the law, under our law, right? So that could be ways you could help someone get over this idea that um, God is punishing an innocent person. The third objection is, if satisfaction of divine justice through punishment is a precondition of God's pardon and salvation for us, how is divine justice satisfied when the person who committed the wrong isn't punished? Right? So if we're, we're, we're still committed all the sin, but we're not punished. How is that, how is that satisfying divine justice? Well, this is where the representative part comes in. Christ is our representative substitute by means of his incarnation so that by his death, he satisfies the demands of divine justice on our behalf. So the union of humanity with Christ is the basis of our sins being imputed to him and his righteousness imputed to us. So we can say, we can say when he's punished, we're punished by proxy. He's punished, we're, he's the, our representative and our union with him. So, yes? So are you saying that in your view, our union with Christ is logically prior to the imputation of our sin? They would say it happened at the incarnation. When the second person of the Trinity took on hum, human nature, that unifies humanity to Christ, and he can be our representative. And he's our proxy when we, when we put our faith in him. So, yeah, I mean, um, is that what you're saying? That um, well, I guess I meant more in the sense that, like, believers who are united to Christ. Upon belief, yeah. But they're also saying that God, God started the whole thing by become, becoming incarnate and taking on human nature as the second Adam. That's our next one. Yeah. No, I, I'm more asking, um, this, is, this is a question I've thought about. Are we united to Christ and um, thus be like righteous to bear the penalty for our sin? Or does he bear the penalty for our sin such that we can merit I don't think I understand. What is he saying? The first one. The yeah. Question. Yeah, it's the first one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a good question. And we identify with him when we when we put our faith in him. Right. Yeah, Audrey. Uh, imputation of our sins on the cross. Okay. And number four is the cross is unjust because punishing Christ is like cosmic child abuse. Have you ever heard that? No? no? <laughs> well, first of all, this is a terrible caricature, but God doesn't hate sinners. But you can see how maybe people might get that idea. Um, have you heard a real fiery preacher say that God is angry with everyone and... and that's why Christ came. But first of all, it's not God hated the world, so he killed his only one and only son. Because what does John 3.16 say? God loved the world, right? So that, that can't be right. Uh, Jet? But who cursed the ground and stuff? Well, what, what, 
the way I the way I would say it is he's angry because he loves people and sin destroys us. So God hates what sin does to us. And I just feel like we need to steer clear of rhetoric that implies that God is an angry father who poured out his wrath on his unwilling um, innocent son. That's not a good care. That's not a good explanation of, of the atonement. Well, there's lot there. There's lots of verses like that. I would steer clear of it when I would be when I would be talking about salvation and the and the atonement, especially. Yeah, because what are you going to do with John three sixteen, right? So I think you're you're better to say that God God's wrath is on sin, and his hate he's hating sin, and what sin does to us. Um, John Calvin said. The father was, in fact, not angry at or hostile to the son at the crucifixion, even if in the midst of his suffering it may have felt that way to Jesus. That's in the Institutes. But there's a need to clarify Christology on this one, I feel like. Um, Because Christ wasn't merely human. The second person of the Trinity voluntarily took on human nature and gave his life for us. So far from being child abuse, it's a demonstration of God's love that the second person of the Trinity would condescend to take full, the full force of sin on himself to redeem us. So it's not that Christ was an unwilling, innocent son. He was very willing and in sync with the will of the Father in, in giving himself. So last one. So if Christ suffered the punishment that was due for all men, doesn't this imply universal salvation? So Christ's atoning death potentially accomplished the redemption of all men, but this redemption is actualized throughout history when persons come to be united with Christ through repentance and faith. Um, So to become beneficiaries of Christ's atonement, we must be united with Christ That's the identity with Christ, united with Christ, right? Um, Through faith and baptism, whereby we identify with his death and resurrection. It's only insofar as we are in Christ that his sacrifice on our behalf becomes efficacious, that he becomes truly our representative, what we were talking about, I think, what you were talking about. Yes. So there's lots of theories. There's even more than I gave you. Uh, But I think when they, I don't pit them against each other very much. Even remember I said I could even do the ransom to to Satan and the payment to God. I I know, I'm weird. (laughs) But uh, so they, they take it together, they explain the data. And then, you know, there are responses to objections that I know we went through them kind of quick, but there's responses to help people understand the kind of the caricatures maybe that they have, especially in Christology. And, you know, now we're ministers of reconciliation. If you're a Christian, our message is you can be reconciled to God, and we're supposed to be ambassadors. That's in 2 Corinthians 5. So... um, these were the books I used. All good. They're, they're all a little bit different and emphasize different stuff. But anyway, that's it. Okay. We're over. We're over.